everyone, welcome back to What Magic Is This? A podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. Today we have to step right back into the Fool's Gallery in which we will be talking about a specific figure in magic and the occult who I think has certainly added to the story of magic itself. And in this one, we have an absolute doozy. And it's one of these figures that probably should have been covered on the show a little bit sooner, but I'm so happy to be covering it now. And I have the perfect guest today. And they have studied religion, new religious movements, occultism, and paranormal experiences for over four decades and has advanced degrees in religious studies and American cultural studies. She has practiced Sufism for two decades and has studied Swedish-Finnish shamanism and mid-Hudson Algonquin indigenous traditions from native teachers. I would like to welcome to the What Magic Is This podcast, Professor Wham. Professor, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. No problem. Before we even get into the topic itself, I think some people will be wondering about your moniker, Professor Wham. How how did this come about? Well, um, as you mentioned, I'm a practicing Sufi and have been for, I guess it's been like 25 years now. And um, when you join an order, uh, you're often by your teacher given a name that is intended to uh, provoke you into growth. It It doesn't necessarily reflect where you're at, it reflects what your teacher, where your teacher thinks you need to go. And so um, my name started out as Wahaba or Wahaba is how you actually pronounce it in Arabic. And over time, uh, other names accumulated onto my name, uh, uh, reflecting various levels of initiation. So my uh, my total um, Arabic name is Wahaba Hadia Al-Muid. Wham came about, W-H-A-M came about because I have a friend about 20 years ago who, um, well, I guess it's been 17 years ago when I first got on Facebook. I used that moniker on Facebook. It's a little bit different now. My moniker is on Facebook, but she absolutely refused to spell or pronounce it. So she created (laughs) the acronym Wham, which is an acronym of my name. Now the professor part, and that just stuck. So right. what what ended up happening is that um, eventually down the road, I became a co-host, a periodic co-host on uh, the Church of Mabus radio broadcast, right. uh, which is a paranormal supernatural podcast. And when I started on there, Jeffrey, who's the host, he asked me what I wanted to be called. And I said, call me Wham. And he was like, why? And I, and I didn't tell him all the stuff about, you know, the, the Arabic. Um, I, I just said, well, you know, it's like my, it's like my super, you know, my superhero name, you know, wham, pow, you know, that. Right. So that's, uh, so that's where the wham got stuck on me. Now, lots of people call me wham. Uh, professor started uh, a little bit later. I, I live in the mid Hudson Valley and prior to the pandemic, I did a lot of um, public presentations on various topics, paranormal topics, uh, metaphysical topics, uh, um, spiritual topics. And one of the places where I did this at was a a coffee shop called the Enchanted Cafe, which no longer exists now. It was one of the casualties of the pandemic. Uh, But but, but the the guy who ran the place, Joe, started calling me Professor. Okay. And then, and then he started calling me Professor Wham because I do, you know, I am a doctor. I do have a doctorate. I have taught at universities, um, and um, so Professor Wham, he started calling me, and it stuck. So fantastic. So that's, how, that's how that all came about. I have to say, uh, of all the people that I've interviewed, and well over a hundred people. Professor Wham has got to be the greatest of, of names that I've, I've got here. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy saying it throughout the entire episode. So uh, before we get rolling here, what happens is that my podcast topics, for the most part, are picked by poll in, in Patreon. And I was so happy to see that uh, this figure that I'd had in previous polls, and I don't think people uh, picked them very much, but finally they got enough votes to be on here. So today we're going to be talking about somebody, as I said, who I probably should have had in the show a lot earlier because their name 
uh, seems to come up quite a bit. At least when I started in Magic uh, over 20 years ago, they were a name that everybody needed to know. And, and, and perhaps with this podcast episode, we'll get this name upon a few more people's lips. And this person that we're going to be talking about today is Dion Fortune. And so, Professor Wham, who was Dion Fortune? Well, um, Dion Fortune was um, an individual who, she was a, I would say she was probably, a, she was a younger contemporary of Aleister Crowley. She was born in 1890. I can't remember exactly when Crowley was born, but he was born before then. So he was, and, and he died a year after her. So, uh, it, so um, he had to have been obviously older than her, but she was uh, born Violet Firth, I can't remember her middle name, into an, an upper middle class family uh, in southern England, and, um, or southern Britain, I should say. Because I think now it's Wales. It wasn't at the time. See, that's the thing. You right. know, there, there's all these hidden politics behind a lot of what she does. Uh, she was born into an upper middle class family. And um, she became interested at a fairly young age in esoteric spiritual stuff. Um, and uh, eventually, over time, she ended up joining... First, she was interested in theosophy, so she joined the Theosophical Society, which, of course, is, was it was the British branch of, you know, uh, what Blavatsky had started, and she eventually ended up leaving them because uh, she felt that they didn't take Christianity seriously enough. She always seemed to be sort of a mystical Christian in her yeah. orientation, um, and eventually she ended up joining a, a lodge that was well, she. She became familiar with uh, some of the uh, other occultists in in Britain, um, and you know, so she, so she became familiar with the folks that, who who were still kind of hanging on to the Order of the Golden Dawn. She the, the way she described them is, you know, she, they were all old men and tattered old women, you know, that were right. left by the time she kind of got uh, in touch with them. But she did end up eventually join, leaving the Theosophical Society and joining uh, a group that had split off from the Golden Dawn. Uh, I can't, I, th I think it was called... Uh, um, alpha et Omega. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I was going to say Alpha. I, I was, yeah, I was going to say Alpha and Omega. Alpha, alpha and Omega is what that means. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it was from there that she really began, I think, to learn... Uh, the fundaments, if you will, of ceremonial magic. So she she also had some rather significant connections. They were personal connections uh, to the spiritualist community, which comes up later in some of her work. Uh, but um, from from the Theosophical Society, she became fascinated with the idea of uh, the ascended masters and and sort of. I guess what we would call now channeling, you know, right. speaking in trance, that sort of thing. Um, and she became convinced that there were, you know, masters speaking through her, one of which was Jesus. <clears throat> it's so fascinating how d so many people have Jesus talk to them and he says kind of different things. But anyway, uh, it's, it's always been interesting to me. It's, it's always about Jesus, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, um, so she went on from there. Um, eventually, um, it was it was while she was in that association that she joined up with a guy who his name, his name was Lovecraft. Not Lovecraft. It couldn't have been Lovecraft. I, what am I thinking? Lovecraft. What was his name? It was Love something. Love Love, love Day. Love, oh no. Uh, lo, no 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 no. Love Day. Love Day. Love Day. That's yeah. right. Um, See Lovecraft, you. That's where my brain goes. <laughs> Lovecraft. Whoa. No, we are not talking. We, we are. We are not going the Kenneth Grant route. No. no. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, um, um, so she, he, and her got together, and they started having. Um, they created a series of papers. I guess it was in the early twenties, like nineteen twenty-two, something around in there. Uh, the, over several months, that eventually were collected into a a text that we'll call the cosmic doctrine, which is kind of, I think the distillation of, of what her thoughts were at the time. Although people who have done analysis of that book say that there's a lot of influence of Loveday's ideas in there. Um, but 
you know, she uh, eventually um, the succession of the group had to be, uh, you know, people died and she offered herself as a successor to the group and they wouldn't accept her because <laughs> she was kind of young at the time, kind of a young initiate at the time. And so she ended up forming her own group. Um, uh, the, what is it? Was it the Fraternity of Inner Light or Correct. The, yep. Society of Fraternity of Inner Light, something like that. And that group was the group that she worked with um, up to the point um, of her death. Um, and that group ended up being um, relatively significant in the sense that there were lots of uh, there were lots of people who came through that group in the same way that a lot of people went through um, the the Order of the Golden Dawn, you know, um, and ended up doing significant things. So a lot of people ended up going through the fraternity and doing significant things. And so it's really kind of through that that we have to sort of see her. Uh, see her legacy, if you will. Um, and she wrote a number of works at different times. Uh, I think probably the the two that are the, well, between Saint, the three that are most considered are um, Sane Occultism, which is actually a series of essays. Right. Um, and, um, and then Psychic Self-Defense and then her Mystical Kabbalah. Those are, those are the three that are side, sort of, um, cited as the most significant. Um, I, w when I was preparing for this talk, I mean, I, I've read a lot of her stuff, although earlier in my life, you right. know, I've, and, um, uh, and so I, I wanted to read some stuff of hers. Oh, she also wrote novels, yeah. which, you know, she, she, which we can talk about later because those actually fit into a certain genre that a lot of people really don't know that much about. And, and I think that whatever significance they may have, have to be sort of seen in the light of that genre. Um, but, but I, I wanted to kind of remind myself, you know, of her because I hadn't read her for a while. And so I got, uh, I, I, uh, if you have Amazon prime, you can actually listen to her mystical Kabbalah and her psychic self-defense for free. Nice. It's oh. th those are, f those are for free. If you have, uh, if, if you have um, Amazon prime, especially if you have audible, but even if you don't, I think you can still get them. And, uh, and so I just, you know, spent the last couple weeks, three weeks listening to her stuff, reminding her, reminding myself of her, um, and, and the book that I decided I would go ahead and read was, is a collection of her letters or excerpts from her letters, uh, that she wrote to her magical members of her magical society and to other people who were interested during the second world war. Um, and they were collected into a book, um, and edited by Gareth Knight. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's called the magical battle of Britain. And actually, and which here it is, Magical Battle of Britain. And it's a, it's a thin little book, but it's actually got a lot of really cool stuff in it. And we can talk a little bit about it because I think that she is in this book, she's actually applying all of her stuff right. to a, to a specific set of circumstances historically and, um, and, and to a fairly wide ranging group of people, um, through traumatic times. Yeah. I mean, she's like writing this during the blitz. There's a part of, there's a, there's a portion of it that, that she wrote, like after the building they were staying in was bombed, you know? So it's, it's, it's like, it's real stuff, you know what I mean? You know? And so, um, you know, if people ask like, what is her relevance now? It's like, well, you know, there might be some, <laughs> you know, because, um, she, you know, she went through some difficult times towards the end of her life and, and, and that, that, so that's not insignificant. Certainly. It's uh, interesting that you mentioned that it's been a while since you read Dion Fortune because for myself speaking, uh, Dion Fortune was pretty much when I first started doing a shift uh, from 
more chaos magic based to ceremonial lodge based magic. Dion Fortune was the only person whose books I could get in the Edmonton library. It's, and if people don't know where Edmonton is, it's in Alberta. It's North Alberta, city of just less than a million people. You couldn't find Crowley books. All of the Crowley books at the library were always stolen by people. But you could, <laughs> but you could, yeah. which is true. It's like you UFO go, books, Crowley UFO books. Yeah, gone. yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. It's, it's you, gone. You can't get them. But I could. I, I was able to read Saint Occultism. I read Psychic Self Defense. I read Mystical Kabbalah, and yeah, that's those were the only occult books that I could get. And it's been a long time since since I read them. And, and I I peeked back in myself over the last little while to Mystical Kabbalah. And um, truly, it's, it starts off a bit interestingly, but uh, I she's – that is probably, in my opinion, one of the best – approaches to what we can consider hermetic Kabbalah available right now. I think it's a, it's a really interesting, it was, it was cobbled together, I believe from uh, a lot of her work in when she released a, uh, kind of like a magazine, truly. Um, yeah, called, yeah. 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 It was, it was called, I think, oh, it was it the inner light or I, I the name of the something, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. That, yeah. that might've been the s- subtitle. How did Dion Fortune get her name? It was, how did she go from Violet to uh, Dion Fortune? Well, there, there she, it was it was a, a res, result of several things. So when she was in the temple of of Alpha and Omega, uh, she took the magical name Dio Non Fortuna. See, by God and not by luck. So Fortuna had to do with the goddess of luck, right? Um, and eventually, she, it, it was contracted to Dion from okay. Dio Non. So. Um, cool. yeah. Um, well, I mean, when, when, when you asked me to do this, one of the things that cracked me up, uh, this, this is something that happened when I was, oh, this was back in the nineties. Uh, I, at different times in my life, two different times in my life, I've had the opportunity to work in, uh, metaphysical bookstores, uh, and, uh, so the second time I was working in a metaphysical bookstore in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, in in the 1990s, I was actually getting my master's degree in religious studies, and so I and and I needed extra money, you know, because you <laughs> need that. So I was I'd gotten this job at this place called the White Light Bookstore in Kansas City, Missouri, and I don't know if you remember Gnosis Magazine. Oh yes, yep. Gnosis Magazine was publishing at that time. And there, they had they had a. Um, it was like the early '90s, and they had a, an issue. It was it said Gnosis Magazine, the Northern Mysteries, and then they listed the, a subtitle like what they were going to cover. And so one of the what they said was the Northern Mysteries, runes, Odinism, Alzatru. Dion Fortune, they stuck Dion Fortune on the end of it because they were somebody had written an article about her and they had put her under Northern Mysteries. And I thought to myself, in an odd way, that's sort of appropriate for her. Yeah. She, she she was kind of an interesting person that had a lot of contradictions yeah. in her. Like for example, one of the things she emphasizes in saying occultism. Um, and it is part of cosmic doctrine as well, uh, is this idea of the polarities, which she talks a lot about, which of course becomes the topic of, you know, her sex magic book, her esotericism book. It's certainly a big part of her novels, you know, this whole business about the male and female polarity. And, and that's something that's sort of come down to us through Wicca and other things. And yet she herself was apparently not really predisposed towards physical sex. Yeah. Um, uh, and in fact, lost her marriage over that. Yeah. Be, and, and so she, uh, she was, she, she considered herself, I think in some ways to be the counter. Um, and she, and certainly in, in psychic self-defense, she says things like this occasionally where it's really clear that she's making a distinction between herself and the ceremonial stuff she's doing and what a certain other guy, Mr. Crowley was doing at yeah. the same time yeah. and all the things that he was talking about. Cause he was completely about sex and completely about doing all of that. And she wanted to make sure that she wasn't that. Right. 
you know, um, and, and, and yet at the same time, she does emphasize a lot, uh, especially in psychic self-defense, how there is a, a sizable component of, of things like vampirism and, and, and psychic attack that can be a kind of disguised sexual energy. Right. So she does, you know, she, she, she pulls on Freud and all that kind of stuff to talk about that. Well, and that's the other thing I didn't mention Bef before she got, while she was involved with the Theosophical Society, she became enamored with Freud. Yes. And she developed, a, she had a very early um, career as an early kind of psychotherapist. And this was before they required people to get um, educated and, and get like, a, you know, get, have a degree before you could put your shingle out. Right. So, so when that happened, she obviously couldn't do it anymore, but um, she, she, that also underlies a lot of what she does. Yeah. You know, kind of her psychological approach to, to occultism. She's very much a product of, of a specific period of time uh, in England where the whole idea of psychoanalysis is, is forming, but also you have that, Odd spiritual ecosystem with theosophy, spiritism, uh, uh, sorry, spiritualism, magical mm -hmm. orders, and she's she's right there in the middle of it, and it does make her. All of these things have a very um, apparent influence on her when you read any of her books. It, it's it's really quite interesting. Uh, during the First World War, she had this experience, and part of it was something that you mentioned where. She had a vision of what are known as uh, secret chiefs or ascended masters. Now, what, what's the significance of, of this first experience through the rest of her life? Well, I think that what it did was it convinced her that she did have these contacts. Right. You know, because in the Theosophical Society, um, it was a fairly hierarchical... Well, to, to follow up on what you said, and this is, this is part of this, I think, um, um, you can see Crowley is rebelling against Victorian England. Mm -hmm. Dion Fortune is very Edwardian. Yeah. Th think Downton Abbey. Yeah. yeah. Ser seriously. I mean, and that's kind of where she comes from. Uh, but this, ex but in the Theosophical Society, it was a fairly hierarchical society and only certain people really could channel the masters, if you will. Um, it was kind of like, you know, whoever the leaders were, um, they would confer that power upon certain disciples. If you, you know, that's kind of how it worked. Not everybody could just like open their mouths and do that. And I think that what it, I, you know, what the impression that I get when I ha was, have looked at this is that I think that it convinced her that she had this ability too. Right. And, and so, um, not it gave her a sense of her own spiritual authority so that so that she felt like she could go and you know eventually down the line you know develop her own sense of spirituality but also in an interesting kind of way it i think that it sort of introduced her and this is where the spiritualism comes in i think it quite, sort of introduced her to this more general idea of of something that's always going to be sort of a tension in her work, which is the democratization of those kinds of abilities. You know, if you know about Alice Bailey, you know, Alice Bailey talks about, you know, the exteriorization or the externalization of the hierarchy. And of course, there's a lot of debate about what the hell that means. Right. You know, I, you know, I mean, if, if you think about it in certain ways, I mean, th there were certainly Aryan you know, na national socialist um, theosophists who took that in a very fascist direction, yeah. you know, those kinds of ideas. Um, but I don't, I, obviously, I don't think Dion Fortune did that. Um, but I think that on some level, and this is what, this is actually an analysis that Gareth Knight developed through some of his work. Um, the idea that the hierarchy, the spiritual hierarchy, um, as it manifests in, say, an occult order, eventually what the purpose of that is, 
is not to recreate that hierarchy strictly in an occult order, but to permit an atmosphere that will allow the unique spiritual capacities of each individual to emerge hmm. so that the whole can sort of create its own set of things. And I think ultimately, and I say this because of, excuse me, what her approach became during the Second World War when she was trying to set up this kind of spiritual network right. uh, across not only Britain, but across Europe and and parts other parts of the world. Um, because she really did see what was going on in Nazi Germany. And I think actually she was correct about this. Mm -hmm. She has some very prescient things she says in this book about uh, about her sense of what the Nazis are really about. Because I think most people really saw uh, Nazis or fascism as just kind of this weird political fad. Right. People don't realize that fascism was actually a, a considered to be one of the expressions of progressive. <laughs> of, pro of, of progressive statehood at a particular point in time. And she, I think, correctly understood that there was something about what the Nazis were doing, uh, their particular expression of it, that was a little bit different than that, that it had, that was, that, um, that had a spiritual component that could be very dangerous and I think that she understood that. And so for her, um, this, this notion that it was very important to bring diverse people together to, to create a, a, a more universal, democratized sense of how, uh, of how spirituality or spiritual and, and ceremonial practice could help people develop their own connections to that. So I think that, uh, you know, that's a way of talking about sort of the eventual unfolding of, of the effect of that experience of the Ascended Masters or on her. You know, it grew in her over time, yeah. you know, it gave her a sense of her own authority. And then I think that it helped her see that that means if it, if, if it happened, would happen with her, then it surely could happen with other people. Definitely. It's one of the reasons that the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn blew apart is because some of the lower ranking members, they wanted access to the secret chiefs that Mathers and, and the, the, the founders right. were, were talking about. And that just became unavailable and the whole thing blew apart. Um, I want to hang on the idea of spiritual orders as well because – uh, we don't have time to get into every single order that um, Dion Fortune came across. She was involved in some small way. At least her her mentor was involved in Freemasonry. Right, lo right. Loved talking about Atlantis. But then Theosophy and then Alpha and Omega. And, but what happens is that there's always these conflicts. Dion seems to get into quite a bit of fights yeah. and squabbles uh, with people, even such things as Moira Mathers, uh, who was McGreg uh, McGregor Mathers' uh, wife. Right. Uh, but what does this tell us about the personality of Dion Fortune? What do, what do we know about how she was, um, not just when... Well, for, first of all, she was a Sag, which oh, well, means Sagittarius, yeah. <laughs> which, yeah. which means that automatically she's going to kind of get in people's faces. Yeah. Uh, um, and, it, you know, I don't know what the rest of her chart was, but, you know... She, uh, She's going to be enthusiastic. She's going to, she's going to, she's going to push boundaries. Right. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it, and to be honest, I mean, you know, I've been a member of, I'm like, I'm a member of like three Sufi orders and I've, I was in, I was in an occult lodge for a while in the late eighties, early nineties. I've been involved in a number of different, you know, esoteric or spiritual groups and the kinds of conflicts that she was talking about are really common. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, whenever you have, well, and they're common even in common religious groups, you know, um, uh, it's, I mean, part of what, part of what keeps regular religious groups from, uh, I mean, from, from completely blowing apart, which a lot of them do blow apart is is that you know at some point you develop an ecclesiastical order and that but that order has to constantly be evolving mm -hmm. in order in order to continue to be relevant to subsequent generations i mean you can look at you can look at any 
religious group and it does this. Um, so, you know, the, the, the arguments that she got into with leadership or with other people were, are not unique. Um, the fact that she did get into them though, tells me she was willing to fight for, <laughs> for her opinions, you know, especially at a time when, um, it was not common for a woman yeah. to be, to be at the head of a religious order. I mean, if you look at most of the orders of the time, even though women were, could occupy places of importance in them, they were still mostly run by men. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, I think she eventually founded the order that she could manage, you know what I mean? That eventually yeah. would reflect sort of, you know, where she wanted to go with things. So she, she was certainly a person of her own mind, uh, a, a person who was convinced of her own spiritual experiences. Um, and it's not, and you know, to her credit, She's, you know, when it comes to like the mystical Kabbalah or that kind of stuff, she's not just making crap up. You know what I mean? She's, she, she, you know, what makes like the book, the psychic self-defense book still really relevant, I think, is that she, most of the techniques that she talks about are tried and true. They're not, they're not bizarre. You know, they're techniques that she learned, techniques that she, um, techniques that she worked on, techniques that she watched other people do. She gives credit where credit is due. So-and-so taught me this. This person does this better than me, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think that, I think that she was a person who was just convinced of her capacity and lived it. Yeah. Yeah. She seemed unafraid of, of, her own confidence and her abilities and, and that she could hold her own in, in any situation. She really, it's, it's unfortunate she had such, she didn't have, well, it wasn't a, an overly tumultuous, but at the time it would have been seemed as a somewhat tumultuous personal life. A um, couple of, um, one of her marriages indeed did, did rupture pretty uh, spectacularly. But um, one of the things that pretty much, Every this is a complete diversion, uh, but I, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it, uh, Professor Wham. But the one thing when people bring up Dion Fortune now that most people know is what is called the the magical battle of Britain, and you brought yeah. it up in the book as well. So, what what went on in this situation? Well, um, first of all, we have to remember, and it's difficult, I think, for us now to really comprehend this. Um, because America has been kind of insulated from this mm -hmm. kind of thing. But, you know, she had lived through the First World War, and the First World War was devastating to Europe. It was horrific. I mean, it was horrific on a level, again, that I don't think Americans really grasp. Um, and then in the late 30s, you have this crazy person, you know, we now call him Hitler, but he began to just sort of begin the process of taking over parts of, you know, he's just invaded Europe, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And um, with this massive army, you know, twice Germany is, you know, have this massive army twice in, in one generation or a generation and a half. And by the time she does this, this Battle of Britain or begins this process, uh, because that's what it really is, is a process. Um, England is pretty much standing alone. England is, you know, uh, England is like, knows that it's the next target of the Nazis. Uh, and so um, what she does is she creates a, um, a network of people. And you have to remember that this is before the internet. So this is all being done by courier, by mail. Eventually the mail system collapses, the postage system collapses. And so a lot of this is being done by courier. Right. Um, so um, she sets up this network. And what's interesting about it is it wasn't just her society. It was also other people, other people who knew other people, spiritualists, anybody who wanted to be a part of this pretty much. Um, and what she did was she began to, um, first it started out as weekly letters and she would go and, um, 
she would give everybody, everybody had to agree to do this. And at a certain time and place, uh, they would send the letters out beforehand, you know, like a week before. And then everybody together, more or less, insofar as they could, would meditate that week on a particular set of symbols or a particular idea. And the reason for, and through that process and the letters that she would send, she, she gradually, the idea was, is that she would gradually create, uh, you know, kind of an egregore. That's the yeah, best way of yeah. putting it or, or creating a, a, a dome of protection over Britain. But in order to do this, you have to unify people um, that are highly diverse and so that's why you, she picked symbols rather than any particular doctrine. Right. And she talks about this, symbols rather than any particular doctrine, certain ideas rather than any theology. Um, and she now she does use some interesting language um, in, in the letters that, that does have to be talked about a little bit. She talks about like the, the, the group race. Yeah. Now and and she uses the word race in some interesting ways. Now by the time she wrote these letters, she was using the term race a little differently than she had used it in the past. And this is one of her critici- one of the criticisms of some of her earlier work is, you know, she absorbed certain very normal uh, well they're not nor- normal now, but they were at the time normal British ideas and theosophical ideas about group races and, and the evolution of group races. And obviously at the time when she was growing up, you know, England had this huge sprawling empire and people tended, you know, to call people that were darker by certain names and other names that, you know, anyway, she's talking what she means, what she means in these letters is a little different than what she has meant previously. And she's referring specifically to people who consider themselves to be British. And the reason this is important is because she's including the Celts in it. Mm. Um, Even though she does talk about the Celtic race as kind of a separate thing, she understands that we're talking about the British Isles. So you can't just be English about this. You know, we're already talking about a bunch of different types of people. And um, so she talks about the, 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 she talks about the, 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 the group race. And she also talks about the nation and what she's referring to from what I can tell in the nation is an ideal of the nation, whatever the the UK was considering itself to be at that time. Um, So if you read her now, you have to be sort of aware of how she's using language um, so that, because, because now of course, all of our, you know, all of our antenna are going to be up about that kind of stuff, you know, and, but but a lot of her occult principles are still valid, even if you can't use that language, right. because it's important. Again, it's important to understand what she was trying to do. She was trying to create a a, a bridge, a kind of a universal bridge, um, to all these different kinds of people that were going to be in this network. And now she and that she she did. I do think she did believe. I think that if this was done correctly that it would keep England from being invaded. Okay. Now, England wasn't invaded as such. Uh, I mean, there were some incursions, and obviously there was the Blitz, which which she did live through. Um, In fact, they continued to write and do this stuff through the Blitz, which I think is extraordinary if you think about it. Um, Eventually, towards the end of the war, in the last 18 months of the war, Um, they had to go to a monthly newsletter because of a paper shortage, basically. So they, and and because it had become too dangerous and and the postal system had broken down. So trying to find couriers that could take this stuff out on a regular basis, it was too difficult. What's nice about this particular book is that this, this particular edition was edited by Gareth Knight. Right. And so what he does in it and he's edited the letters. He's got he's got this. First of all, he has an introduction to her, and it's a great introduction, by the way. 
By the way, just as a, a parenthetical, I got to meet Gareth Knight oh, cool. uh, uh, back in, uh, was it 2003 or 2004? I went to a, a conference in Waco, Texas, of all places, <laughs> um, that, was, that was held by Baylor University on new religious movements. It was the 10th anniversary of the, uh, of the, uh, the siege on the compound. The, the well, Branch yeah. Davidian Crusade, yeah. and I had, I, and and I had the great honor of interviewing David Koresh's mother during that same time period. But anyway, for some reason, Gareth Knight was there. I have no <laughs> idea what he, why he came to this conference, but Strange. for some reason he, but for some reason he was there, and um, he wasn't presenting or anything. He just showed up, and I had a series of excellent conversations with him. And the last day we were there, we had lunch together. It was great. He was he was terribly interesting. For the anyway, listeners, who is Gareth Knight? Gareth Knight was well. He he died a couple of years ago. Yeah. He he was um, he became a, a, a kind of a devotee actually of Dion Fortune, and then was eventually initiated into. Uh, the order that she founded, even after she died, he was there. He left in the 60s because they sort of developed a more Christian orientation than he was really interested in. Right. But but he ended up um, develop, founding his own association. I don't know that it was an occult order in quite the same way. But I don't know. I don't think it was an initiatory order. But um, he... Um, he was an author, and he, in the later part of latter part of his life, he sort of became a. He helped to um, edit and get a lot of her stuff republished, right? Because he really liked her uh, specifically. But anyway, what's cool about this book is that not only does he edit the letters and do a, provide a great introduction to her for each letter, he tells exactly like on the each letter was dated for the day that everybody was supposed to meditate. And what he does is he, like, for example, for April, April 28th, 19, 1940 on the 20th. So on the 28th of April, everyone was supposed to meditate on certain things, but that was the day that Germany officially declared war on Norway. So he tells you what's going on in the war. That's cool. Yeah. And then gives like a little summary of like, um, what what happened after that, and if there were any possible effects of the meditation, what they might have been, um, or what her responses to certain events were. And then at the end of the book, he he uh, for the weekly letters, he has a list of all of the of the meditation subjects, hmm. so that you can kind of see what they were, what her because it, it developed into a kind of curriculum, right? Okay, actually, um, and she ended up revealing at least on a meditational level, not on a ceremonial level, but on a meditational level, she ended up revealing certain things that they actually did in the lodge because she felt that it was important that some of that stuff be shared at this crucial time. She didn't live very long after World War II. What were the, the last few years of, of her life like? Well, she died in 1946. And uh, apparently um, she was, she was, that was another reason why they had to go to a monthly thing because she wasn't doing well. She developed leukemia. And so that was the, that was the, uh, what killed her finally. Tragic. Yeah. There's, it is true. Yeah. She did. She was younger than Crowley. Um, Crowley was born in 1875. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so she died, I believe she was only 55 years old. She was yeah. young, 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 yeah, young person, yeah. but um, her influence is still very vast. Let's, let's talk, let's take apart some of the things that she's contributed to, uh, to the world of magic and mysticism and the occult. So, uh, let's take a look at three of her books. And these are the ones that a lot of people are going to be able to find. I believe you can find them online. A lot of libraries will have them. The very first one is a book she wrote in 1930. And this is the one that I think that most people kind of know of her work, which is Psychic Self-Defense. Take us through why this is an important book. Um, Psychic Self Defense was the first book of hers that I read, and okay. and the and in you know years ago, um, I you know I was I started out as a you know in my in, in my ceremonial magic stuff I started out as a Crowleyite, 
<laughs> so, you know, I, 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 because I'm just kind of a pervert. And anyway, um, well, I think, you know, ultimately, I think what it was, was that Crowley kind of scared me. And so I, I always go towards what I fear. Right. So, so, you know, that's why I, I went to him first. And I actually, I think his theory, magic and theory practice is still probably one of the best primers about cer- the ceremonial part of it mm-hmm. that, that you can find. Um, but psychic self-defense, what I think what sets it apart from other books like this is that she does a, re- she does a really, really good job, I think, uh, of combining just good basic psychology with, um, with occultism, showing how they can support each other. And so that you can tell the difference, learn to tell the difference between um, an, an actual psychic attack, which can actually, as she talks about, can actually be fairly subtle. A lot of people think that psychic attacks are like, you know, right. <laughs> you know, or, you know, the movies, you know, it's like, it's like actually psychic attacks are often very subtle and people don't pick them up at first. Um, and that's, they're supposed to be, you know, that's part of what she, and so if, but if you know psychology, then, she, you know, she, she kind of leads you through how you can tell the difference between, uh, you know, just when someone's being a fuck, at, you know, and just being a butthole <laughs> right. and when someone's actually like throwing the evil eye at you, right. you know, which is a whole other thing. So she, she does a really good job of sort of showing how those two disciplines can support each other. She also does a really good job of, uh, and the, and the, and the other part of that is I think because she had been in conflicts right. with people. Um, and that one of the first instances of psychic attack that she talks about in the book didn't have anything to do with occultism. It had to do with an individual that she knew at a place of employment. Right. And that's where a lot of us will experience that kind of stuff. You know, we call it malignant narcissism now, but, it, it, you know, um, uh, you know, um, the, the fact is, is that, you know, that's what, that's part of what some malignant narcissists do is exactly the kind of attack she's talking about because it's what gets into your head. Right. Um, um, the, the, and the book is divided into several sections. And so, the, you know, she sets up the, and the sections are considered, are, are supposed to be progressive. So, you know, she gives an introduction to various things in the first section. In the second section, there's a lot of her experiences, you know, um, and things not only that she experienced herself, but stuff that she observed in other right. people, you know, and, and other people's techniques, you know, what she, what, what, she, you know, she has no problem at all talking about people who do have done a better job of exercising than she has, you know, and what they did and what they didn't do. And, you know, and she, and like I said, she gives credit where credit is due. There's, um, she, you know, another, another, um, set of techniques that she talks about in there in the third section, she, she gives a shout out to the, to new thought, which a lot of people really don't, you know, which is another um, spiritual set, set of spiritual healing techniques, which probably are best known in their iteration in the Church of Christ Scientist, but were actually based on the work of a guy named Pinius Quimby, um, and probably the the best the best um, and most efficacious user of New Thought techniques was Emma Curtis Hopkins, who, if you really want to know what the hell that is about, you need to study her right because because she was an extraordinary human being i mean it's estimated that and she was a contemporary of of dion fortunes it's estimated that emma curtis hopkins trained 75,000 people in her life right. and 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 is responsible for the founding of three different rel- uh, spiritual movements and she didn't even know it cuz she didn't give a shit right. she didn't care she was just healing people that's all she cared about right but her, but 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 there is, she talks about some of the stuff in New Thought and how powerful it is in the hands of someone who knows how to really use it. So but it isn't what she does specifically. But so those are the first two parts. And then the third part is, are the techniques. 
of psychic self-defense. You know, if this happens, then you can use this. If this happens, then you can use this. And it's really basic stuff. It's, it's stuff like, you know, um, she gives you some prayers, some invocations, some visualizations, and it's, it's good, solid stuff. If you know occultism, if you know mysticism, um, she talks about the relationship between occultism and mysticism, which I had forgotten about mm-hmm. actually, um, when I, until I re-listened to it. And she says, she says, listen, if you've got an occultist and a mystic, um, actually uh, mystics can do things better than occultists if they're highly developed. <laughs> and we, and we don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he says. We, she says, we don't know why. Um, but, but they are similar in that their techniques differ, but they're similar in that their goals are similar, right. essentially. That's what they share. And, but so it, you know, if you know anything about that kind of stuff, you know, the cert, doing the circle, the archangels, um, uh, using elementals under certain circumstances, but not under others. I mean, all of her stuff is very clear in the third section, very plain um, not, you know, I mean, she's, she's, she's using Edwardian language cause that's the way she talked, but it's it, past that it's very, she's very easy to understand. And, and I've, when I was listening to her this last time I was going, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> you know, of course, of course, you know? So, um, I, I always recommend her book. In fact, I recommended her book just recently, that book to my Sufi teacher, Oh, cool. Because Sufi, you know, um, one of the things that whenever a person begins, whenever in an initiatory order of any kind, and you begin to develop in certain spiritual ways, you open yourself up to yourself, uh, to stuff maybe you've been hiding for a while, but you also become really open to other people and other influences. And depending on how porous you are, you, you might absorb some stuff that's, you know, you get too porous. Right. You have to learn how to sort of um, protect yourself in a way, over time, protect yourself in a way that's not defensive, mm-hmm. but, is, but is, you know, I guess we would call it now good psychic boundaries, right. that kind of thing. Good psychic boundaries, <laughs> you know. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's talk about the one that, uh, that uh, I think, in my opinion, this is... Uh, it's funny because she's not known for it in her lifetime. She wasn't known for it, but she is now. And that's the book, The Mystical Kabbalah. Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I actually think that, as I mentioned earlier, this is the most, one of the best, most succinct um, kind of like summaries of Hermetic Kabbalah that exists out there right now. Um, but how influential was this book at the time? And, and, and would you still recommend this book to people these days? Um, well, you know, there was a lot of stuff on the Kabbalah uh, at, in the late 19th and early 20th century. I mean, you know, Crowley, that was Crowley ba- <laughs> it was his thing, you know, and, and his entire life was, you know, if the Golden Dawn, you know, their, their great goal was to synthesize astrology and Tarot and the, myst- and, and the Kabbalah, Hermetic Kabbalah, very yes. specifically yeah. Hermetic Kabbalah. Um, then Crowley's goal was to try to figure out how you could map the Enochian system onto that, which it doesn't, by the way. <laughs> I mean, there are some overlaps. There's some overlaps, but it's it's not it's not a clean no. It's not a clean system on top of each other. Um, so it's like, I mean, even um, you know Louis Milo Duquette, who's a great who's who I like a lot and has done probably the best summary of both Anakian magic and Telema that I've I've come across. Even he does not try to map them no. onto each other, no. and he knows them both really well. He does. Um, but I think the reason why her work gradually over time, I think that there are two main reasons for it. One is that her approach to the Kabbalah was adopted by other groups um, and and became popularized the writings of what's her name Dolores Ashcroft Nowicki, right. um, and eventually uh, through through that eventually made its way into other like Gareth Knight uses formulations like that actually um, if you're familiar with the work of Caitlin Matthews and John Matthews mm-hmm. um, who I'm you know I I know I've 
fortunately become friends with Caitlin Matthews. I appreciate her, the thrust of her work very much, but she utilizes, she was a, a student of this in the same society as Dolores or Ashcroft Nowicki. So you can kind of consider her to be sort of in the same lineage, if you will. But I think it was because of her approach. I mean, the way that Crowley approached the Kabbalah was as sort of a, 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 a like if you look at his 777, you know, that portion of the 777 where he, he tries to stick everything, all the mythologies into it. Yeah. I think he saw it as sort of like a, you know, like a, I don't know, like a filing system or right. something, you know, yeah. where yeah. you could just sort of shove crap in there and, and it would all fit. And then you could use any system you wanted to, you know, which is kind of what Kenneth Grant does, which I kind of disagree with, you know, I mean, you're, you're always going to find it, I mean, and, and to me, this is kind of the what I consider to be the soft imperialism of, of Crowley is um, and and the whole ilk of that, um, which is, yeah, everything's universal because we're going to make it ours. You know, we're going <laughs> to we're, yeah. we're going to we're going to take voodoo and we're going to take this and we're going to take this and we're going to make it ours. And how do we do this? By stuffing it in to the Kabbalistic tree of life, the hermetic tree of life. Her approach is very different. Uh, she she sees um, it hermetic Kabbalah for what it is. It's a form of Christian Kabbalah. Um, Christian Kabbalah goes all the way back to the early Renaissance, when um, you know there were various people who um, became interested. Um, Mirandola was one of them. Became Pico de Mirandola became because you know intellectuals became interested in certain forms of mysticism. Um, and they were exposed to um, Jewish Kabbalah and adapted it to created a Christian form of it. And that's the basis, actually, for Hermetic Kabbalah is the sort of Christian Greek reinterpretation right. of, of Jewish Kabbalah, which is actually quite different in a lot of ways. <laughs> you know, I've I mean, I studied Jewish Kabbalah for 10 years, you know, yeah. under under rabbis. So it's like I. I know the differences. I mean, <laughs> the archangels aren't even the same. You know, no. it's like it's uh, the, the, and the whole approach is different. But she she understood that I think, and so she wanted it to be an actual an actual mystical system, um, and combines it with psychology, right? So that it can be applied more directly um, to your inner life. Mm -hmm. Because if you look, for example, at what um, Dolores Ashcroft Nowicki did, who is kind of, she was actually who I was introduced to before Dion Fortune. Oh, okay. And she, and she, she um, published a book that were a series of meditations, interior meditations that you would do with the Sephirot and then with the paths. And the purpose of those was to, was to, to create an interior life that you could use as the basis for your own understanding of, of, of how you could map ceremony onto that. It's actually fairly sophisticated. And, and, but the basis for that, and she talks about it, is Dion Fortune's approach. Uh, because for Dion Fortune, these, the, the different sephirot are emanations of the divine. And they do connect with planets and things like that because those are all exterior manifestations of interior realities. But the way that we connect with those things is inside of ourselves. And so that's what she's trying to get us to do. And I think that's why calling it the mystical Kabbalah is a good idea because she's, it, she's using the Kabbalah as a means by which to... Um, uncover your own internal connection to higher and deeper realities, which is completely different than Crowley's approach. Yeah. Yeah. Crowley's approach is very materialistic. It's very, it's very acquisitive. It's very, um, let's see how much power and knowledge we can accumulate so that we can sh use it for what we want. And, um, and that's reflected in the various Think the various groups of you know the various groups that have come out of him. That's not to say that everybody in those groups are like that, because no. <laughs> I I know that that's not true because I know some of them. Right. You know I know current members of the OTO, so I know that that's not true. But um, I you know if you look at the general thrust of him mm -hmm. compared to her, she's much more interested in spiritual development and yeah. mystical development. 
yeah. than than she is in um, acquiring power. I think that the the fact that the word mystical is actually in there is like right. a great key to that. It's like okay, so this is not this is not me trying to utilize all this stuff for spells. This is a, this is a form of mysticism, and it is it is you're entirely correct. It is very Christian, like it is. old school. Like Jonathan Roiklin, you like, sorry, Johannes Roiklin, Christian yes. Kabbalah. But it, it, it's, it is, it is, it is. It, it's still a, it's an interesting read. I think uh, I think it's one of the ones that of all of her works, I I think. Uh, Psychic Self-Defense and Mystical Kabbalah are probably the two that most people should read. Uh, let me, let's me let talk about a book that I have no idea what to make of. It's a tough one. And I only I read it back again when I was first trying to do the shift from chaos magic to more austere, let's call it group-based magic, um, or at least I thought so at the time. Uh, her book, The Cosmic Doctrine. Oh, it was always produced posthumously. Uh, it wasn't released until after she had passed away. But uh, what is the cosmic doctrine? Well, that's that. That's again. That's that very early text that was produced with her and Love Day together, and it was a series of papers, really, a series of revealed papers. And I think it's, I think it's important to kind of see those those papers in context. Um. Because what was going on in occult and spiritual groups at the time, like especially the theosophical groups, is that you had you had people who channeled stuff that they were getting from ascended masters or whoever they thought their guides were, and they would get they would get these different systems you know, these different systems of enfoldment. And at the very same time, they would get, it would give you a view of the universe. I mean, the, the, probably the most extensive version of this I can think of is uh, the Arantia book, which a lot of, I don't know if you're familiar with the Arantia book, but the Arantia book was a book that was produced, well, it was produced over uh, several decades. Um, and it started out, um, it started out as a as a text that was produced by apparently a guy who was the nephew of John Kellogg of the Kellogg Serial Company, and um, and what it does is it they were sort of and then they 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 would receive information from again Jesus was another yeah. dude they were receiving messages from but these other ascended masters too. And they were given like an, a complete reinterpretation of the cosmos, an, an alternate history of Earth, an alternate history of Christianity, all in this massive tome. Um, and the cosmic doctrine, I think, was sort of the way in which, um, because she was doing this with Love Day, it's the way in which um, Dion Fortune was both signaling her connection to these ascended masters and at the same time um, receiving sort of a definitive way of understanding the way the, 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 the universe works. I mean, Alice Bailey was getting stuff like this. Um, the I am people of the I am movement were getting stuff like this, you know, Edgar Casey was getting stuff like this. So this is this is this is something that people are doing. Right. All right. So she's doing it too. Um, I think the most important thing to understand about the cosmic doctrine is that the basic idea is that there is a plan for the universe. There's a plan for humanity. There's a plan for Earth. <laughs> you know, it all kind of fits into this a plan. Um, and there's, there are stages of growth that people go through that initiates go through and that, um, some of this can be governed by your initiation and your spiritual practice. And some of this is governed by unseen forces that work through you and on you, excuse me, to help you through this process. Um, it's a doctrine insofar as 
at the time when they put it together. It was it was the distillation of everything that they had learned up to that point in order, you know, these are the truths as we know them right, <laughs> right now. It was cosmic in the sense that it was universal. Mm-hmm. I, to me, I think it's her, her answer to Blavatsky personally. Uh, okay. That's what I, you know, so uh, that's, you know, if you read it with that in mind, hmm. uh, that, it, that it's kind of her answer to Blavatsky because she felt that the Theosophical Society did not take Christianity seriously. Right. And so there's a lot in the cosmic doctrine that has to do with trying to universalize Christianity in a specific set of ways. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's actually what the Arantia book is trying to do as well. Um, frankly, that's what A Course in Miracles is trying to do, mm-hmm. if, you, if you are familiar with it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there... One of the things that I studied, I've never, I've never parlayed this into anything. Maybe I should someday. Was the history of uh, the history of revealed scriptures in the West, particularly <laughs> the United States, but but also in 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 the UK, and because there's a huge long history of this, there this, is going back going going back <laughs> quite a ways. If you go go back to well, even Swedenborg, you know, yeah. way th- there's a huge history to this. You know, we've we've got we've got to augment the Bible. We've got to clarify the Bible. Create a third testament. The Book of Mormon is that. Right. I mean, it's it's like America's just Americans just barf this shit out like you would not believe. <laughs> you know, but but you do find it in other places too. But anyway. I think it's useful to see the cosmic doctrine as part of a trend. Mm -hmm. And it was really her, um, her answer to some of the problems and the tensions that theosophy brought up in her. So she has to make Christianity, a kind of mystical Christianity as cosmic, as cosmic as, as, uh, as anything Blavatsky came up with. Interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting perspective. It's one of those things where, you would think that her influence on in trying to bring Christianity more so into ceremonial magic and, and the occult would be the thing that she's known for the most. But uh, she spent time in Glastonbury and her influence, I think, these days is seen way more in things like Wicca and, and right. the neo-pagan movement. So why does she as, have... As one of the Northern Mysteries. <laughs> right, yeah, right. But why, right. What, what, what she, why, why did this happen? Like, how is it that she had the, the biggest influence on on that kind of very specific... I'm talking very specifically about, and, and until you the go... Brit, the, the, Brit, the Brit trad tradition. The Brit the trad, trad, like, how did yeah. this happen? Well, I don't think that she meant to do that. No. I, I, I think, I think. Well, Gareth Knight talks a little bit about this in her, his introduction to her in the psychic self defense, because one of the things that she ends up doing towards the end, you know, in the in the in the monthly things, she does give us an extended set of articles and essays on the Arthurian tradition, right. which um, we have to talk a little bit about that because <laughs> because. Um, well, and Gareth says that she became a little bit more paganish as she got older. And I think it's because she eventually ran into what Tolkien ran into, mm. which is when you realize, and, and this comes up actually in, in some of these articles that she wrote, you know, during the Battle for Britain, um, eventually they realize any occultist worth their salt realizes that the what is called the Western tradition broadly, what is called the Western tradition broadly is not European in origin. Mm. It is Greek, it is um, it is Greek, it is Roman, it is Mediterranean, it is Egyptian, it is Sumerian, Babylonian, it is Persian, it is Arabic. Yeah. Okay. And that and ultimately that's what it gets down to. In fact, when I was going through the stuff I was going to talk about, I realized, oh my God, I, I have to mention these books, even though they, they seem like they have nothing to do with her, but they do. Um, the, are you familiar with the, the author Idris Shah? Yes, I am. Yeah. 
okay, you know, he, he was, he was the person who did the first kind of broad mainstream introduction of Sufism to the West in the mid 20th century. One of the first books that he wrote, and he later apparently was ashamed of this book. He, he, he was, uh, it was, it's because of how, because of how now racist it is. Um, <laughs> colonial, the, the title. It was called Oriental Magic. That's right. the name of the That's title. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and this, this book was written, it was published in like the 1950s, early yeah. 50s. And, and he also wrote a couple of books on magic, um, like one on alchemy and one on magic. And mm-hmm. he wrote these to make money. But the reason these books are important is like this book on Oriental Magic it's him actually going to places in Egypt and Syria and places you couldn't go to now because, you know, they've been destroyed by war. He goes to these places and he talks to people that are still doing the same kinds of magical operations that are recorded in cuneiform. Right. Okay. And this is the basis for the circle for the pentagram, for all that stuff. All that stuff comes out of the Middle East and the Near East and the Mediterranean, all of it. And I think what happened eventually over time with Dion Fortune, as what happened happened with many English-speaking people like Tolkien, they realized that they had forgotten their own traditions. Mm -hmm. They realized, even though there was some of that around, they realized, you know, Tolkien wrote his 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 Lord of the Rings stuff that came out of his quote unquote realization working in linguistics that the English had lost their traditions. There were no English myths, even though there are English myths, but there were no English myths that he saw. So he wanted to create a world that was based in Northern European stuff. Um, and that's where that comes from. The Arthurian stuff even though the basis for it is actually in France and uh, and a lot of the structure of it is actually Islamic in origin. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. But some of the story elements, some of the content is Northern European. Some of the symbolism is Northern European. And so what ended up happening during the Victorian period, um, as in, you know, English people realized hell, you know, I can't become a Persian, you know, (laughs) we've conquered, you know, we've tried to conquer, they didn't conquer Iran, but you know, we've, we've tried to conquer these people, but we're not these people. Who are we? Uh, What ended up, what ended up happening is this sort of, you know, even though the Arthurian stuff is Islamic and Celtic is what it is. It's Islamic and Celtic. All of a sudden it becomes English. In, in, in the during the Victorian period, it becomes English, and it becomes kind of forward, you know, kind of foregrounded as this primordial set of 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 British, you know, kind of writ large British symbols, um, and um, it's not historical, <laughs> you know. It's it's no it's, no. <laughs> it's not historical. Um, it's a reconstruction of a non of of a non linear thing. But I do think that there is a powerful symbolism in there, mm. um, and I think that um, her connection to that stuff. Um, I don't. I think she was just beginning to get connected to it, and then what's hap- happened is that later people people who were responsible for developing Wicca, um, you know, like the, not so much Alexandrian stuff, but like the Ferrers, for example, yeah. or, or, you know, later like, um, Dolores, um, no wiki Clark and, and, and then Caitlin Matthews, they, they're the ones who pulled all that stuff forward yeah. to, and kind of recreated it as a sort of modern, uh, a modern mythological thing. Um, you know, it was, it was, it's a different way of, of trying to, of, of, you know, trying to refine what Britain is. Right. Um, and it's okay. I mean, I, I, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but I mean, I like some of the things that Caitlin Matthews has done with that because she instinctively understands 
that it's a reconstruction. Right. She gets that. Yeah. And, but that doesn't necessarily make the, the interior symbolic value of the work any less important. Right. And so she has figured out ways of, of developing that um, specifically so you can use it that way. Um, but I think that, I think that her, her, her emphasis of, on the Arthurian stuff is sort of what people brought forward. Cause you know, Wicca is a reconstructed thing. It's not there. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, I mean, as a true is a reconstructed thing. I don't care what anybody says. It's a historical reconstruction. Um, and you know, the hidden, the hidden hand in all of this is Diana Paxson, of course. Paxson. <laughs> uh, do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, oh yes. You know who yep. Diana Paxson is? Okay. Uh, because, uh, you know, she, even though um, Marion Zimmer Bradley is given credit for writing The Mist of Avalon, it's actually Diana Paxson who did most, most of the, most of the ghost writing and the, in the historical research into that. So that, that work, that work is actually more hers hmm. than Marion Zimmer Bradley's in many ways. Um, and, uh, so, but anybody who, who knows that knows that anyway, anyway, and Diana Paxson has been, um, largely responsible for, uh, for the, the American, um, resurgence of Northern European, specifically Germanic and Scandinavian Northern European pagan, paganry in, in, uh, in, in North America, at least. I know that I, I know there it I know that Edward Thorson slash Stephen Flowers would like to correct, take credit for that, but I will not let him. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I respect his scholarship in a lot of ways, I will not let him take credit for that. Oh. So <laughs> you know. There's a wonderful book called Triumph of the Moon by Ronald Hutton, and uh, Dion Fortune plays a large part in that book. I think if people are interested in seeing this very odd thing that Dion Fortune didn't set out to do it, but she became in a, a way a huge influence on on British Wicca and British neo paganism. Right. It's it's a really good way of, of taking it uh, taking a look at the whole situation. Right. Well, well, and I think, like I said, I think it's due to her approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you know she's you know she had her own, I mean I, she was raised upper middle class English yeah. you know yeah. I mean she's gonna, she's gonna be committed to the Church of England until she dies I mean that's just the way you can't you know you can take the you can take the girl out of the Anglican Church but you can't really take the no. Anglican out of her, and um, but that doesn't mean that as time went by and as she developed that she didn't open herself up to more and more and more different things. Yeah. Now there's something that we definitely have to talk about professor Wham, because I know I I've suggested mystical Kabbalah to people uh, and we touched on it uh, or you touched on it a little bit earlier. I suggested mystical Kabbalah to some, some, somebody. And I remember them writing back and saying like that first chapter when this Dion fortune is talking about my race and the white race, mm -hmm. That is part of, and, and you just mentioned you can take uh, the girl out of the Anglican <laughs> C of E, but uh, you can't take it uh, out of them. But Dion Fortune, when a lot of people squint and look back at her work, and even the work of Gareth Knight, they see they see very prudish kind of ignorant ways of looking at race. Um, Gareth Knight specifically wrote in a book on, on Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalistic symbolism, he said, homosexuality like drugs is a technique of black magic. In spite of the modern state of apologetics for this form of lower emotional and physical relationship, it is a perversion and an evil. This is the kind of stuff that one who is not prepared for it will come across in the work right. of, no, of, no, you of Dion Fortune. So right. Right. how do we put this in context for people? Because, I mean... We, you kind of have to. It's it's there in her work, and it comes no, up. No, no, no. You have all to. the time. Well, you have to, and I, and I think that there. I think that there are two ways of looking at this. First is understanding that she was speaking always, sort of, with the specter of Aleister Crowley back here. I mean, seriously, you know, Aleister Crowley engaged in all these things. Um, he referred to himself as the beast. Um, he, he considered, now he had a different interpretation of what it meant to be a black magician than I think even what she had. Mm. Um, because 
I mean, I know that I don't think of him as being black, a black magician in, in the way that some people think of that, because I've encountered real black occultists. Right. And Crowley, Crow, you know, Crowley practiced things about power, but he also was, he also had had the experience of his guardian angel. And so he had had some of those higher levels of, of experience. And so he was always sort of in turmoil with himself about those kinds of things, because he was trying to break out of what he considered to be stifling Victorian attitudes right. about sex and stuff. And so in the process of that, got himself like addicted to heroin, you know, and, 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 you know, and that kind of thing, you know, and addicted to sex, right. that kind of thing. Um, and so to some degree, um, you have to kind of understand that, that they are, they are positing themselves very much in opposition mm -hmm. to that kind of ma to that quote unquote kind of magic. Um, and they also both reflect very kind of conservative, prudish values um, that are part and parcel of where they come from. I mean, when I talked to Gareth, when I sat and talked to him, had lunch with him, I mean, he was an older man. He he was an admirer of Margaret Thatcher. Okay. <laughs> So he was complaining <laughs> about all the immigrants coming into Britain. Right. Now, I I wasn't going to argue with him as an American over lunch, you know. Right. But but you have to understand that this was, despite all of that, he was also had great stories about Dion Fortune, you know. So you have to you have to understand that that's it's it's like it's like in AA. They say take what you need and leave the rest. Right. Um, you, you're, you're not going to get everything you need from these folks, no. but you're going to get some good basic principles. I mean, you know, I come from a tradition, my, my Sufi tradition, you know, the teacher that founded my order, you know, he was a guy of the early 20th century too, as an Indian from the early 20th century. He didn't understand homosexuality. He has, he has very traditional ideas about w the role of women in a family. You know what right. I mean, so you know when you're reading his stuff about marriage, you're just like, you know, my eyes are rolling to the back of my head. It's like, <laughs> well, that's never going to apply to me, you know. Um, so it, you're going to encounter that in right. in a lot of older, a lot of older material. I do have to say this about Dion Fortune, though. If you read her stuff sequentially, like you read from the Cosmic Doctrine, the Theosophical stuff, and you read up to the at, towards the end of her life, what you do find is a progression. Mm. She does her her language begins to change about this kind of stuff, you know. Whereas in the past, she would call black people hot and tots. She drops that at a certain. Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Like, ah, <laughs> ah. You know. I mean, we have the N word in English. You know, in American English, yeah. in British English, hot and tot is the H word. I mean, it's like that. That's like the bad mm. word. She says stuff like that, but then eventually, over time, she softens a lot of that. And, and, and I'm not trying to defend her and saying she became woke. I don't think she ever was woke no. as what we mean it now, <laughs> but she, it's clear that she is growing right. it, that, that her view is changing over time, that she is softening her, her rigidity mm -hmm. about some of those things. Um, and um, it, it, those are just things you're going to run into. I mean, if you're going to read any material, I mean, this is the way I would put it. Which is more offensive, her saying that or Crowley taking all of these different cultures and cramming them into his version of the Kabbalah, yeah. Yeah. into a kind of spiritual colonialism? I mean, seriously, which is more offensive? They're both about the same wow. <laughs> offensive as far as I'm concerned, um, because, you know, he has decided he's deciding what Venus in, a, in another culture is. You know, right. he's, you know, um, anyway, you know, in, in my, uh, so in I my... tell people be gentle, 
Yeah. Be gentle. Yeah. Be gentle. If something offends you, you can just say, you can, you know, everybody has to decide for themselves, right. like what they're going to do with the material. Um, Personally speaking, can I can I basically sure, jump in here? I yeah. think that what's interesting about uh, Dion Fortune is that she's such a wonderful cultural time capsule too of time in England, where uh, right after World War One, all the way up to World War Two, where you just get to see the uh, the the very strange, mainly middle to upper class English attitude, and and she is reflective of this kind of. There was a societal furor over uh, the idea of homosexuality within England at the time, and she is completely reflective reflective of that. Yeah. And it's and yeah. it's interesting to read that. And um yeah, she in one hand she could talk about freedom and spiritual freedom and the other one she she can say that these people are below beasts and things of that nature. And but you get to you get to really see that with a lot of these figures contradictions are a lot more interesting. You learn more than coherences. <laughs> and, and and particularly as time goes forward, um Dion Fortune is such a wonderful little um, and just like Blavatsky, just like a really interesting way of being able to look at, my goodness, times have changed so much. Um, but we look at these char- the, we look at these people and we look at these characters and we, we just see how far we've come in some way. Uh, but yes, if that's one of the things that can turn people off of, of their work, I, I totally understand. I mean, right, it's, right. I'm yeah, not going mean, to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shove Dion Fortune or Blavatsky at people. I think that they should be looked at, but I'm, I don't want to defend their views. Well, no, I mean, I, and I think that it's a fair thing if a person is spiritually searching. Mm-hmm. I think it's a fair thing to look at, to to look at, you know, something like the mystical Kabbalah or psychic self defense, and th- and ask to ask yourself, you know, what what is good about, you know, what is good about this material that can be brought mm-hmm. forward, and 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 dump the rest of this stuff, you know, and, and, and people are doing things like that. Like, like, I I mean, probably a good example is, you know, I love, I love Lovecraft. I think Lovecraft was a brilliant, sick bastard, um, (laughs) in a lot of ways. And, and his, and, and, and he was, he was, he was racist from the word go. Oh yeah. But, but, but the, but the essence of his horror can be distilled in such a way that 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 racism can either be used mm-hmm. to make it, you know, in a different way. Like there, there, are, there are movie makers, you know, filmmakers who have like taken his st- that stuff and reversed it, right. you know, so that so that you, you you get to see it working in a different way, or it can be removed entirely. And and the horror horror portion of it is still there. Like you can take you can take. Uh, the, the racist stuff out of uh, and the classist stuff out of, of a story like you know colors out of space and the weird shit still remains. Right, it's still weird, you know. So, and people are doing that, like when they're remaking his stuff or rewriting his stuff. And I think that that's fine because you know, if it to me, it's like if 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 that if Dion Fortune offends you, well then just take the mystical Kabbalah, rewrite your version of it, and take that shit out. <laughs> I mean, it's because that's what occultism is about. Mm-hmm. It's not about enshrining one group or one person or one set of techniques as the way to go. It's about spiritually evolving yourself so that you can use what is useful about the, the knowledge that these people did have or the techniques that they have and make it your own in the way that it is yours and reframe it reuse it, redeploy it. I love it. That's great stuff. My goodness, Professor Wham, we have barely scratched the surface on Dion Fortune. There's things I wish we could have talked about, things like channeling and mediumship and maybe even talking about uh, the, her conversations with the adept uh, known by the name. I'm sure this is a name that uh, quite a few people have heard, Jesus, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Her, but her novels. Her novels. <laughs> her novels as well, yeah. she's She wrote, uh, was it The Sea Priestess? Um yeah, she wrote. She wrote like six or seven. Yeah, movies. they're so, interesting stuff as is. well. But I have yeah. to ask you, you know, her name's not as big as Crowley. She does stand in opposition of Crowley. They're kind of like, um, I wouldn't say they're two sides of the same coin, but they're definitely two figures that are very do similar things in very different ways. But I have to ask you: is is Dion Fortune a worthy figure for people 
uh, who are consider themselves contemporary magician? Is Dion Fortune worth people's time? I, well, I think so. Uh, I mean, especially if you're a beginner. Okay. Um, I, I think so. Um, at least, at least three of her books. You know, Saint Occultism, um, Saint Occultism, Psychic Self Defense, which is actually useful even if you're not an occultist. I mm. think. I think. I think part three of of that book is is really really useful. I still find it useful today. Um, and, um, and her mystical Kabbalah, if you want an understanding of Kabbalah, of Christian Kabbalah, that, that, that might be useful in terms of approach. I mean, you know, not everybody's a ceremonial magician anymore. I mean, that's, that, that's no. a very, that's a very specific set of things, but, um, I think that she's, I think that she's useful. I mean, I'm not sorry that I read her, um, you know, Crowley, Crowley, I think is, has become more popular because he's, you know, the one thing that she doesn't do in her books is she doesn't actually give you the mechanics of the ceremony. No, no. And that could, because that's something that you would need to learn. She believed once you actually became initiated into a lodge. And so I think that that's probably part of why Crowley's become popular because in magic and theory and practice, he, 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 he dumps it all. He gives it to you. And, and, uh, and then, um, if you have, you know, people like, um, what's his name? Donald Craig, who wrote that, who wrote that wonderful sort of primer of called modern magic, mm -hmm. which distills, um, you know, stuff from Crowley and order of the golden dawn. And actually it has a little Dion fortune in it too, all together into sort of an introductory self-initiatory system. That's, that's why I think Crowley has become more popular and, you know, when he's more notorious, she's, she's quieter, you know, Americans like notorious, right? She's quite, she's quieter. She's very Christian. She's very mystical. Some people may not like, you know, may not be all titillated about that. No. You know? And she's a prude. <laughs> if you see, there's very few, there's, I struggle to find pictures of Dion Fortune besides those pictures when she was a teenager in Wales, right. She, right. She, yeah, she, yeah, she didn't take pictures of them. And there's teenager. two or three of them that you can find, and she just looks like, she looks like one of the Monty Python members in drag as like, like just, yeah. and I'm not saying that to be cruel, just the getup is very... 1930s, although she, the picture was probably taken in the 40s, English housewife, the hair parted she, she was to very, the back. She was, very, she was very dowdy. Yeah. yeah she was, yeah. she was, she didn't consider any of that external stuff to be that important. No, no. And uh, it, it's very interesting. Yeah. I've, as far as I'm concerned, Mystical Kabbalah is definitely one of those things that I think everybody should read it. Yeah, and uh, for the same reasons that Professor Wham put forward, it's a very good distillation of Christian Kabbalah um, and and in some ways hermetic Kabbalah, though less. Uh, but I think Dion is a, an interesting figure, one worthy of investigation, certainly. I think that for the reason I, I just mentioned of that, that neat little time capsule to a period of time in which England – was no longer the center of the universe. It's It was starting to fray at the edges before World War II and the eventual just the fact that the U.S. was going to be the major superpower. She is more than Crowley, I think, more emblematic of that that those Christian British values through a, right. ma a magical very, very, context. Very, very, very much so. I mean, that's what I mean. It's like, think Downton Abbey, yeah. that, that time period, because right. it's the same time period. It is, yeah. It, it's, it's it, you know, it's very Edwardian, um, end of the Raj, end of the yeah. Raj, um, um, struggling to discover what what it means to be British now, that 100%. we're going to lose our empire, that we're going to lose our empire, you know, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Oh my goodness, there's so much we could have talked about. There's, but guess what? We might we have to have you. Part, we we, 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 we might have to part, have you back. <laughs> we, we could do a we could do a part two about about uh, occult speculative literature of the early twentieth century. <laughs> I love it, Professor Wham. Tell the people what you've got going, what's going on in your world, and where can people find your things? Uh, you produced a book not too long ago called uh, Mysterious Beauty, and uh, yeah, right. just just tell us all of the things. Well, um, I have a I have a website, uh, professorwham.com. 
And on that website, you can find my various vlogs and blogs that I've done. Uh, Mysterious Beauty, um, Living with the Paranormal in the Hudson Valley. I'm mostly known more for my stuff around the paranormal than I am so much for, you know, spiritual occultist stuff. But I that obviously is my background, yeah. <laughs> as, as, you, as you have seen. Um, but um, right now, all I'm really doing um, is is adding to those vlogs, those blogs. In fact, uh, the most recent one that I put up uh, is, is a three-part um, distillation that w- I was requested to do, uh, teachings about the, um, about the principle of ice in the Northern European tradition and its connection to runes and its connection to certain forms of shamanism, um, because that's another area of, of expertise that I have. Um, so that's, that's probably the best way you can, you can reach me through that website. Um, um, I have a, a YouTube channel that is professor Wem, uh, well, prof, prof Wem, um, at, at, no, professor Wem at, uh, at, on YouTube. Okay. Um, and if you go to my website, you can actually find links to it and go to it and see what I'm doing. But, um, I also have a book, another book. It's a book of short stories that are that are Lovecraftian in nature, called Final Season. Both of these books are available on Audible if you want to listen to them rather than purchase them in hardcover or you know. So, at some point, I'll probably write another book. I don't know when because I have to work all the time. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so but. In the meantime, we do these fun little podcasts. Amazing. Well, I'm so happy that we were able to get you on and talk about Dion Fortune, somebody who I know, I again, I should have had them covered a little bit earlier, but I'm very thankful that we were able to get you on the show and we were able to hash it out over uh, over Violet, over, over Dion. Over Violet, Violet Firth. Violet That's Firth, yes. Such an English name, Violet right? Firth. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. You know the drill, everybody. Head to whatmagicisthis.com. There you will find the links to all of the places where you can find Professor Wham's work, as well as the link to the YouTube and the Facebook and uh, the books there. All of that stuff, whatmagicisthis.com. Also, there's going to be some show notes for this episode. Not a ton. Uh, just a nice little sprinkling of show notes, but uh, there's some actual uh, full books there that you can read, uh, including two biographies of Dion Fortune there. So be sure to head to the show notes for this episode. Do you think that I am doing something special here at whatmagicisthis.com and you would love to show your support in some way, shape, or form? Well, guess what? There's three ways in which you can do this. Let's go through them. You know, I think by now most of you would know these, but if you don't, listen up. So the very first is Patreon. That is patreon.com slash what magic is this. This is the place that I would love to see you. It's only seven bucks a month. I know everybody else is raising their prices and everywhere for membership. It's one tier. It's seven bucks American a month, which is nothing. That's, I don't know. That's like a fancy drink at a bar. That's a throw pillow, not even, you, it's, you can get like half a throw pillow for $7. Anyway, I don't know why I mentioned throw pillows, but uh, I'm going with it. Anyhow, $7 a month, it gives you access to all kinds of exclusive offerings that I have. I do episodes on all sorts of things. It's really quite amazing. Uh, I do videos on how to make your own incense and how to draw a mag- magical circle. I have audio episodes. I just finished one about Agathos Daemon, uh, which is a really interesting entity from Alexandria in Egypt. Although it's not from there. It's actually from Greece. Anyways, it's a, it's a really cool deity. In fact, here's a little bit of a sample of, of that episode that I just released about Agathos Daemon. Have a listen. The Greek language is is special, particularly in this case, because the way that I just said the word agathos daemon, you know, it's really dramatic. Agathos daemon. It's really cool sounding, kind of scary. It's like, oh man, it's it's got some heft to it. But uh, translated as the name is, agathos daemon just means 
the good spirit or the noble spirit or the the noble or good divinity. Truly, <laughs> I got those demons. It's like, hey, here I am. I'm the good. I'm the good spirit. Hey guys. Make way for the Agathos Diamond. Hello, it's me. I'm the good spirit. But yes, uh, not to make too fine a point of it. Now, Agathos Daemon is one of those uh, deities that people are starting to pay a bit more attention to, or at least have been over the last 15 years because of the popular, uh, popularity, the, the resurgence of looking at the Greek magical papyri uh, as a source for doing uh, contemporary magic or contemporary rituals and things of that variety because Agathos Daemon comes up quite a bit in the Greek magical papyri. And to go back to how I started this episode, for people who have not looked at the Greek magical papyri yet, I know maybe just like, ah, it's not really my thing. I really, I really, really want people to take a look at it. And I'll have it in the show notes here, the full thing in the show notes. Uh, you can take a look at it, a copy of it online. Because it's very fascinating. So many different gods get mentioned in the same ritual. And, and part of you will be like, are they, is, is this God the same as that God? Because they seem to be mentioned in the same sentence. Or are they talking about two different gods or... What is going on here, and why is there a why is there a Jewish name or a Hebrew name in there right next to an Egyptian? It's all kind of crazy. And sometimes Jesus just happens to be there. This is weird, but yes, that's what was occurring around the period of time in which some of these scrolls were written and in which they were composed. This crazy syncretic blending of things. So. This is my appeal. Please, if you have yet to even just scroll through something like the Greek Magical Papyri, have a look. It's crazy mind-bending, but it's also very cool at the same time. So yes, Agathos Daemon is one of those entities that recently, over the last 15 years or so, people are paying attention to. And so I thought I was just, you know, I, I should probably do another episode on, uh, on uh, this strange mixing and blending. I did, uh, I think it was my second episode I did on Hermanubis. Kind of comes from the same area. Also a big a deity in a city that I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit here because uh, this city was a magical place. And without hyperbole, it was, I think maybe up there with, you know, Constantinople for a period of time, just the most magical area of the world, at least within what we can call the West. Anyhow, that's just a little sampling of uh, the last, one of the last episodes I did on my Patreon. Uh, I actually also just finished releasing an episode where I talk about a book that deals with psychic phenomena and skepticism and the, the kind of impoverished state of skepticism over the last 20 years. I truly think that the best things that I do, the best kind of episodes that I make, they're all on the Patreon. These episodes are all well and good. I love them. They're so close to my heart. I spend a lot of time on them, but I truly, truly love my Patreon content. It's like a whole different show. You get to see more of what I think uh, makes this world so magical and the things that I think are incredibly magical. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it's seven bucks to get that stuff. And trust me, it is well worth the price. You also get a, a, a link, an invite to uh, my Discord server. And even if you sign up for one month, you you are able to use the Discord for uh, forever. Truly, it's just one month, and you got to, uh, you got the Discord for life kind of thing. But trust me, once you get a little smattering or a taste of the Patreon content for even a month, uh, you're going to absolutely love it. So that's the best way of supporting what I do here at What Magic Is This? Another way of supporting me is through PayPal. If you have a, a little chunk of change you'd like to throw it my way, five bucks, ten bucks, twenty bucks, any amount helps. It all goes towards making this podcast run. It pays for hosting. It pays for plugins for my editing software. It pays for all kinds of things because uh, podcasting is expensive. I know a lot of people can do podcasts podcasting for cheap, um, but it also sounds cheap. I'm not just saying that. Podcasts that spend money 
sound good, and I spend money and on this po- on this podcast and on this show, uh, and I hope it sounds that way as well because uh, I'm spending a lot of money on it. So if you donate through PayPal, it just goes to uh, help that hamster stay uh, hydrated and stay fed that runs the wheel that creates the What Magic Is This podcast, uh, just keeping it the way that it is. And so uh, any amount helps. It all goes to keep me working. Have I mentioned this is my job? Maybe this is a good time to mention it. This podcast, what I do, this is what I do for a living. I'm very lucky, but I can't do it without your support. So please find a way to support me. I'd greatly appreciate that. The last way is not the best way of supporting me financially, but it's a good way of showing your support, and that is buying some merchandise. I don't see very much money from this. I see like, I literally see less than $5 US a month from this stuff. That's, that's, that's how much I make off of my merchandise which might just be, you know, my problem. But I love watching people uh, or seeing people when they send me photos of uh, T-shirts, mugs, stickers, hoodies, uh, tote bags, fridge magnets, coffee, uh, those warm coffee holder things. What are they called? I don't even know what they're called. Anyways, iPhone cases, uh, Samsung phone cases, I don't know. Phone cases. I should just say phone cases instead of listing the brands. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. But uh, all of that kind of merchandise, just head to whatmagicisthis.com. Click on the menu. Click on merchandise. You can find it any at all there. Uh, Somebody just recently bought something. So whoever that was, thank you. Uh, Send me a pic. I'd love to see it. But uh, yes, I don't see a ton of stuff. I don't see a ton of, well, I don't see any money from that kind of thing. Uh, Very little. Uh, Just uh, Pocket change, truly, is is what I get from the merchandise stuff. Uh, but the way that I would love to see your support always would be through the Patreon. And trust me, it's so it's so wonderful. You get so much more stuff. You get much, much more of the kind of things that I think are important to contemporary magic. And uh, it's it's you seriously can't miss out on it. Anyways, that's all I will say for that. But all of these things, all of the stuff I have just talked about, are available at whatmagicisthis.com. Head there, you wizards. Professor Wham, I hope that at some point in the, the not-too-distant future, I was to ask you to come back on the show. I, I'd hope that you'd be uh, uh, willing to do so. Oh, that'd be fun. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's Dion Fortune, everybody. It's a, it's a very introductory episode, but my goodness, uh, this is your, um, your ticket to ride. I've got tons of links and show notes that are going to be in the website for this episode. Please check those out. And, uh, my goodness, um, that's the unfortunate, everybody. All right, come on back to what magic is this? We're going to talk about more of this wonderful, cre- crazed, channeled, austere, masterful thing that we like to call magic, the occult, and the esoteric. Until next time, everybody, I want each and every one of you to stay healthy, to stay hopeful, and to stay luminous. Until next time, goodbye, everybody. ta